Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. This episode is brought to you by UiPath. Human achievement can be slow. 200,000 years to go from the wheel to your jalopy? Really? But today, 90% of the Fortune 500 are accelerating human achievement simply. When AI is everywhere, every process can be automated and accelerated. 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 UiPath, the AI everywhere foundation of innovation. Attenzione, attenzione. Uh, uh, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, the Second World War podcast, WW2, um, with me, Al Murray, and James Holland. And welcome to episode two of our series of uh, special episodes about the Battle of Monte Cassino, or the race for Rome, or however you choose to frame it. And in our previous episode, we talked about the background, the strategic big picture, the people making the decisions, their attitude to uh, what's to come. And th- in this episode, what we thought we'd do is close to the Gustav line. So, James, the Gustav line is eight miles from the Bernhardt line. Yes. So so what you've got is you've got the Bernhardt line go- goes across the through the Mignano Gap. And in the Mignano Gap, it's only about a kind of, you know, a mile and a half wide. And it's got Monte Lunga, which is this long sort of slug that goes down the length of it in the middle of it. And the Via Casalina, Highway 6, worms its way round to the kind of the northern side of, of Monte Lungo and then emerges around the edge of the kind of northern set of hills of which Monte Samucro is the is the big sentinel. And we've talked about that and the Battle of San Pietro and Ernie Pahl and his great thing about um, Captain Wasco and all the rest of it. Then there's a series of little sort of hills in the in, in the valley. And on the southern side of it you've got you've got Monte Camino. Then there's a series of hills and then up in front of you you've got the Liri Valley. And then you've got two other huge chains of mountains. You've got the Aruntzi Mountains on the southeastern side, and you've got the Monte Cassino Massive, which then pushes into a kind of whole range of even bigger mountains to the kind of to the northwest. And the Leary Valley is about yeah, about five miles wide and actually running across the mouth of the Leary Valley. So the Leary Valley runs down on the kind of southern side of the Leary Valley and then joins the River Garigliano. And you've got this Monte Cassino. It's like a think of it like a sort of like a stubby triangle. And so on the southern side of that triangle is the Liri Valley, and on the other side, on on the kind of the northern side of that is is the Upper Rapido Valley, and a whole load of other mountains. And the River Seca comes down and joins the, uh, the Rapido. The Rapido comes down, goes through the edge of Casino Town at the at the edge of the Monte Cassino Massive, then pushes southwards. Comes the Garigliano, the Liri flows into the Garigliano as well, and then the Garigliano continues all the way down to the coast. It sort of turns in a sort of slightly kind of southwestern direction and comes out at Minterno, which is about sort of fifteen miles away from from Casino. And the Gustav Line runs from Minterno on the coast through these hills, Monte Damiano and places like that, overlooking little villages, Castelforte and, and Suio, pushes north into the Runci Mountains, then drops down into the Liri Valley, crosses over the Liri Valley on the western side of the Rapido Stroke Garigliano, climbs up again into Monte Cassino, goes along the Monte Cassino Massive, drops down into the Seca Valley, which is very narrow, only about kind of, you know, a few hundred yards wide, climbs up again to Monte Cefalco, and on it goes over kind of to the Adriatic Attic coast. And it's worth kind of looking at Google Earth, and it's worth looking at, at the maps, because you will, it's impossible, particularly if you do Google Earth and do it on the old kind of 3D thing, it's impossible not to be kind of awed by the scale of these mountains and the scale of the task 
ahead of them. But between these two bits, you've got these hills. You've got Monte Trocchio and you've got, you know, and hills like this and, and Colli um, Cicciarelli and, and, and the Colli Caia and Monte Porchia. And these are all these little hills which are dotted in the valley as it emerges out of the Mignago Gap but before you get into the Liri Valley. And if you were to go there for your summer holiday, this would be balmy, cliched rural Italy, wouldn't it? With villages picked out in white and olive groves. And so if we're trying to create a mental picture for people, it, it, it's what you imagine Southern Italy to, to be like, perhaps. You know, it's it's hills and it's ridges and it's hilltop villages and, and so on. It's not as lush as Tuscany. It's not Tuscany. And, and down in the valley floor, all the villages around Casino are gopping because they were all completely destroyed in 1944 and 1943. And so they'd be completely rebuilt and kind of, you know, light industry has spread. And, you know, they're all a bit charmless, if I'm, I'm brutally honest. But they were certainly very, very charming up until kind of the Germans decided to put a major, two major defensive lines across the middle of them. And, you know, one thing I would say is that when you're on the top of Monte Abate or Monte Smucro or indeed Monte Cassino or any of these mountains and you're looking out on a kind of sunny morning and the mists are kind of lying in the valley and the peaks are rising and the sun is kind of twinkling off the abbey of Monte Cassino and all the rest of it. I mean, it is jaw-droppingly beautiful. And, you know, one again, one can't help but be, you know, the air is fresh and all those sort of things. And if you wanted to feel closer to God, where else would you build build a, an abbey? Absolutely. Um, so it is, it's a very, very sort of geographically beautiful part of the world. But from a point of view of sort of fighting through it, it, it it's, a it's, it's a horror story. Yeah. Um, so just to go back, just one, one little step. I mean, Anzio, Operation Shingle does get the go-ahead and, and Mark Clark does get the ships he needs. In fact, actually gets more than the 20 he, he's asked for. He gets 25, which are available for an indeterminate period in the follow-up. And it's the follow-up that's a the problem. They've, got enough, they've now got enough um, landing ships, sort of 90-odd, to get them to, to Anzio. And that is to deliver a huge number of, of artillery pieces, you know, 3,000 vehicles, two divisions, a follow-up division. So it'll be a chunky, decent-sized core with plenty of firepower and a large number of tanks as well. The thing we should say about Anzio and that Anzio area is this used to be the Pontine Marshes, which is a very sort of famous historical um, area of, of salt marshes, so very low-lying land, I mean, basically uninhabitable, um, apart from on the, along the sort of coastal strip where there's sort of gorgeous beaches and so on. But in the 1920s and 30s, Mussolini has t- decided that this is going to be part of one of his new kind of building projects and, and his new towns. And he's going to build these new towns. He's going to drain the drain the water with with a series of irrigation ditches and a major canal called the, which is needless to say called the Mussolini Canal. Uh, and this has huge banks, 30 foot high banks either side of it, and it is absolutely flat as a post, uh, flat as a board rather. Um, on the the main part of it, sort of extending northwards, one main road going out of Netuno and Anzo, which are kind of sort of little fishing ports side by side to one another on this little pimple that sticks out on the coast. Then there's the Via Anzate, which goes all the way to Urbano, um, which is at the foot of the Auburn Hills, which is just to the south of Rome. And the other major town in the area is Cisterna, which, again, is not very big. And there's a couple of, of model towns as well. There's Littoria and there's Aprilia. Um, and these are underdeveloped, um, towns and there's lots of other underdeveloped features such as a, a road flyover which is a sort of concrete flyover like we've seen many times for anyone who's sort of driven over a motorway or a dual carriage or whatever you'll see what they look like and uh, but but there's no road either side of it it's just the flyover in this this kind of sort of desert flat landscape well that's like your metaphor for fascist italy isn't it Yes, completely, completely. <laughs> and, and then just to the west of the Via Anzata is is the Mileto Valley, which has these weird, it's sort of undulating ground. So it's not flat, it's not hilly, but it's not flat either. There's lots of little kind of, yeah, these sort of weird undulations. And cut through this are a series of river tributaries which go into the Mileto, which are very narrow, usually only kind of sort of, you know, between five and 20 yards wide, but quite steep often, you know, often have banks of sort of, you know, 10 feet, 20 feet high. And they score through this landscape like a sort of like like veins on a leaf. They look really, they're really really weird, and that's another kind of sort of feature of this northern bit, which hasn't 
the sort of western bit of of the Anzio potential Anzio bridgehead. But this is the area where shingle is going to land, and there are key roads in this in this landscape. It has been drained, but it is January. And, you know, it has rained an awful lot. And even the Pontine marshes that have been drained, they still get quite waterlogged. So there's there's potential problems, although it's flat land, so therefore not mountains. So therefore, you should be able to bring tanks to bear and all this kind of all your mechanization and all the rest of it. That's the idea as a sort of force multiplier. That's the thinking behind it. Even so, because it's January and because it's really wet, there are restrictions on that as well. So that's the other thing that needs to be borne in mind. But anyway, so shingle is on, but there is now a plan in place to kind of, okay, so what are we going to, how are we going to do this? And this all falls within Fifth Army's remit. So Sixth Corps, which is going to go for shingle, is part of Fifth Army. And you've also got Fifth Army lined up against the casino front. And when I talk about the casino front and the Garriano front, the Garriano front is the bit down at the south near Minterno, near the sea. And the casino bit is obviously the bit by casino and across the Leary Valley. So Clark's idea, Mark Clark, the Fifth Army commander's plan, is to absolutely hammer the Gustav line in a series of consecutive attacks. So the first one is going to be by by the British Ten Corps in the south, near Minterno on the Garigliano. Then there's going to be a second one by British 46th Division, also part of Ten Corps, at the southern side of the Liri Valley, crossing the Garigliano. Then there's going to be a major one by the Texan Division, going across the River Rapido before it becomes a Garigliano, although actually, strictly speaking, it is a Garigliano at that point. Uh, and the, these series of these ripple-like fist thrusts are going to hit, hammer the Gustav line in a time, and each one is going to be spaced so that it draws off troops to that attack before the escalation of, of assaults leads up to the Rapido crossing. And the Rapido crossing has to happen just before Shingle. So... Shingle is scheduled for the 22nd of January because of all these shipping measures. So everyone's in a bit of a hurry, and that's kind of one of the problems. And at the moment that this has all been agreed, they haven't even got to the Gustav line. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the problem. They haven't done it yet. They haven't even got there so that you can then have these three consecutive fist throws. So in our last episode, we had the meat and the sandwich analogy. They haven't even buttered the piece of bread to bring it up right. to salami. They haven't butted it at all. <laughs> and and it's interesting because in the in the kind of, sort of narrative narrative histories, this bit of it just gets swept to one side. But it's really interesting because the reason why they 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 fight there, having lost the the Bernhard line, the Germans having lost the Bernhard line, you know, by the kind of before Christmas, the reason they haven't immediately gone behind the Gustav line is to buy them more time to kind of build up the defenses more. But really, it's absolutely insane to keep German troops ahead of the Gustav line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you haven't got defences there Yeah. in the same way. You've got these little hills which you can sit on, but you haven't got, a, you know, coherent defences. And there's only one thing that's going to happen, and that is you're going to whittle away more German troops fighting between the Bernhard line and the Gustav line. So you're going to spend people on that fighting that would that, that would be probably much better spent in the Gustav line is the problem. That's my point. That's my argument. And this is the this is the endless problem with fighting every inch, isn't it? Is that in the end, while it might hold the Allies up, while it might bugger the ad- Allies, which it does without a doubt, it makes things very difficult for them, it means in the end your main defensive lines are weaker, necessarily, because you've spent people elsewhere. Kesselring is, is often regarded as, the, you know, in much of the history... His magnificent defence of Italy. Yeah, exactly. Dogged defence, magnificent defence, wily, all that sort of stuff. But in this instance, that doesn't feel very wily. That feels ideological. That feels committed to a notion that actually, in the end, is going to get more of your men killed at a point where what you should be doing is saving your men up. Absolutely. I mean, totally, totally, totally. And so, I mean, the, the, the argument has to be is, is it better to spend, have an extra week or two building up the Gustav line, or is it better to just save manpower and get behind the Gustav line now? And without a shadow of doubt, it's the, it's, it's the latter. And, and, and it seems to me insane that you would think alternatively, but the reason for that is because the moment that Kesselring back in... September 1943 chose to fight very hard at, at Salerno. He suddenly had the Hitlerian spotlight on him. And and Hitler is watching this and taking an unbelievably 
ridiculous amount of um, attention to what is going on. And he's meddling. And he's telling Kessering, you've got to fight for every yard. So for Kessering's point of view, that means you've got to fight for every yard. And you can only withdraw when you're absolutely, you know, you've got one leg and no arms left, you know, and you're you're literally the Black Knight in, in the Holy Grail. You know, so you've got to... It's just a really, really bad, bad idea. And and I was already thinking this when I was starting to do kind of work on, on and I was following the footsteps of a battalion commander who is in the third, he, he commands the third battalion of the 134th Infantry Regiment, which is part of the 44 Hocken Deutschmeister um, Grenadier Division, which is actually originally Austrian. It's one of those ones that's been destroyed. At, Stalingrad has been rebuilt and all the rest of it. Um, 14 Panzer Corps destroyed at Stalingrad is now in Italy, rebuilt, uh, what, what I call a Phoenix division. And, you know, he's got this, he, he's he's completely out on a limb with the rest of 44th Division, which is in reserve, but his regiment isn't. And it's his regiment, the 134th Regiment, which is in the firing line, um, has been attached to the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, even though it's not part of the Panzer Grenadier, 15th Panzer Grenadier Division. It is the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division, which is in this stretch of the line, but specifically the 134th Regiment, which is part of the 44th Division. So all these units are starting to get completely mixed up. And of course, the problem with that is you you lose unit cohesion and you lose the trust of the chain of command if you're constantly finding yourself under different superiors every two minutes, which is what Jörg Zellner, Major Jörg Zellner, the 3rd Battalion Commander, is is finding. So, so, so the Americans attack from the 2nd of January. The 1st of January is a terrific storm, which is a kind of, you know, if that's not a kind of harbinger of what's to come, I don't know what <laughs> is. But it's this terrible storm. There's absolutely no way anyone can do any fighting on the 1st of January. So the 44th Red Bulls are in the middle. This is the 44th Infantry Division. And they are attacking through these little hills, sort of Monty Pork. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the 1st Armoured Division is on the left-hand flank of the 34th Red Bulls. They're attacking Monty Pork here. And the 34th Red Bulls are attacking the twin little villages of San Vittori and Cervaro, which have already been completely destroyed by the fighting on the Bernhard line. And then to the north, you've got the Special Service Force, which is a combined kind of US-Canadian commando kind of thing, who are, are are going to hit a particular high point, high high peak, and then north of that you've got the French attacking up northwards through the mountains to the north, but on the kind of opposite from from the other side of the valley from from Casino. But the main event is here, trying to get through up to the up to the Gustav line, in this as you're merging out of the Mignano Gap, and his. Jörg Zellner's battalion just gets absolutely hammered. He's got the 9th, 10th, 11th company, and they're in and around San Vittori, and they're just completely destroyed. And he's in a bunker in Chavaro getting kind of updates of what's going on and hearing all the shelling. You know, they're getting absolutely crashed around every two minutes. And he writes this incredibly moving diary. And on the 7th of January, he goes, 10 o'clock, enemy signals come through at 11th company, company destroyed, 10th in retreat, that too. Enemy attacks Kiavia. Report to regiment. Enemy is almost in front of command post. We destroy everything and get ready for close combat. Tenth company half wiped out. That's what my battalion looks like. And it's no better on the right and left. Tomorrow it'll be our turn. At night, regiment Goering is deployed on our right or near us and is to restore the old line. The attack is scrapped with incredible losses. Nothing is achieved. Another bloody day is over. And so it continues. I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary. And then on the 9th of January, he goes, two new lieutenants arrive, aged 38 years, never before on the enemy. One was the first public prosecutor of Vienna, the other um, doctor of jurisprudence. They're very shocked. This is not how they imagined the war to be. And, <laughs> you know, he's constantly making sense of this. And he's got this situation. So he is he's a, a battalion in the 134th Infantry, which is part of the 44th Division, which has been attached to the 15th Panzer Grenadier Division and to which he has now got attached a, a company of the Hermann Goering Division. I mean, what a mess. It's so badly run and organised and, and just chaos. I mean, really. Who is he? Where's he from? What's his background? So he is from Regensburg. Right. Um, he's got a wife and two kids two daughters back in Regensburg. He's been a brilliant footballer, amateur footballer in the 1920s. He was goalkeeper for, for uh, Regensburg FC or whatever. Yeah, He's a thoroughly decent, cultured, well-read, 
man who's found himself in this impossible situation where he's an infantry battalion commander and more is being expected of him and his men than can humanly be expected. And, you know, he's just in utter despair the entire time. And and he alternates between kind of anger, indifference, total despair. What's he fighting for? And he's fighting for because he thinks he's fighting for, you know, to save his family and right, okay, okay. Regensburg from Germany from destruction. But but he's right, certainly okay. not fighting for the Reich or anything. You know, I mean, not fighting for, right, for okay. the Nazis. He's, he's right. you know, he's one of these many people that just gets completely swept away in all of this. Yeah. And what oh, happens yeah. is the Americans also suffer quite badly, um, but they do prize San Vittorio, Vittore, then they get Chivaro. Um, the First Armoured do get... Um, uh, Monte Porchio, uh, and these little hills which sort of dot the valley there. And then the last one they've got to get is Monte Trocchio, which is a really interesting one because it's a it's quite a big mountain. It's like 1,500 foot high, and it's got a high point, and then it's got two shoulders either side of it. And it completely blocks your, your kind of view as you're looking down the Liri Valley. And you can't see the Liri Valley until you get onto those shoulders and have a, have a look over it. Uh, and they finally... M- managed to get that on the night of the 15th, 16th, the, you know, the, the, the Germans finally, finally pull back. But, I mean, they're absolutely decimated. I mean, you know, f- 15th Panzer Grenadier Division is just, you know, is, is out of a division of 15,000 men is down to about 3,000. Zellner's battalion is down to sort of double digits. And what's fascinating about this, though, because, I mean, earlier on you've, you've talked about how Hitler's micromanaging everything. This, this offers a brilliant example of actually how that is happening. Um, and what the problem with him doing that is. So Zellner reports his battalion as destroyed, right? Because it's been destroyed. You know, um, what is it these days? It's it's the third loss is is you lose combat cohesion. It's the current thinking, isn't it, right? At the moment, right? So all three, he's had three companies completely destroyed. His battalion's been destroyed, but his regimental commander- Totally destroyed. His regimental commander, which is the equivalent in the British Army of his, his brigadier, his brigade commander, can't authorise that news, can't say, cannot send a message all the way up to OKW, which is the, the, the German chiefs of staff. He can't send that message equivalent, because after all, they're not chiefs of staff, the German army headquarters, because they don't, they don't have that system in place. So we, we, when we've talked in, pre- in the last episode about the chiefs of staff, that's a committee of people arguing a collegiate style about what should happen next, right? Yep. This goes up to OKW, of which Hitler's the boss. So basically, you cannot report to the micromanager in chief that your battalion has been destroyed. You're not allowed to tell him that because he doesn't want the bad news, which means every decision he's made, making is filtered through this fear of giving him the truth about what's going on. So every decision he makes, even though he's micromanaging, is nonsense. And so there's this informational feedback loop of delivering stuff to Hitler that's to his taste that therefore means every decision he makes is unrealistic. Certainly at this stage of the war, he's not listening to any, you know, there are occasional moments where he does actually listen to what people tell him, but this isn't one of those moments. And I think it's absolutely amazing that you cannot pass the news up that your battalion has been destroyed because of, I mean, what's going to happen? You're going to be killed? I mean, you're being killed anyway, but very, very peculiar you know, th- th- this is an unthinkable thing on the Allied side. You'd pass up the news that your battalion's been destroyed and, you know. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely unthinkable. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's interesting because Zellner makes, comp- uh, you know, he, he says, you know, it's hopeless to the regimental commander because the regimental commander doesn't have any authority. So it, it, he said, that, so we're stuck in this cellar and, and my and my companies are getting destroyed for, for, for no good reason whatsoever, but, but just because no one can make a decision. And, and Wilhelm Maus, who is this, this doctor colonel, um, at 14 Panzer Corps commander, he goes, you know, the higher commanders especially live in fear of the Fuhrer. He says, you know, all events, he, he makes this point, that all events in, in, in Italy, in the Italian front, fall under Hitler's eyes. And he demands to be informed about every detail and then constantly intervening. He goes, and then Mao says, so every little adjustment to the front needs exhaustive negotiation and reasoning, which, of course, bites into time, by which point, you know, 11 company of the 100. 3rd Battalion of the 134th Regiment has been destroyed. I mean, so check this out, though. So Zellner finally gets the authorization to pull back from Chavaro on the 13th of January, having been in the line kind of, you know, two weeks and, and been utterly destroyed, nothing left, hardly anything left. I mean, literally 
25 people left in his battalion. They then have to do a night dash across the upper Repado Valley to get to Casino from Chivaro. And that involved go, going over a bit of flatland with very limited roads, very limited bridges, which have been zeroed by American artillery. And they, you know, it is it is just Russian roulette. There's no other way of doing it. You just have to get there, get to the bridge, get to that area, run for your life, and hope you make it. And and he only they they, they do, but only just. You know, shells are falling just ahead of them and just after them, and they have to dive into ditches and all this kind of stuff. They finally get there into casino, and they're kind of weaving their way through this kind of this deserted ghost-like town, which has already been pretty badly bashed about. Eventually someone says, oh, yeah, so, you know, I know who you are. Yeah, you, you're, you're expected to go back there. They go to, um, they go back sort of, you know, eight miles back to a place called Castro Cielo. And on the 14th of January, are told that they're going back into the line in two days' time. And Zana goes, but I haven't got any men. And they go, yeah, you will have by then. Don't worry about it. It's incredible. And he does. And he gets he gets 70 replacements. And that's his, that's, that's his, and they're all 17-year-olds who who are undertrained, haven't got a clue what's going on. Uh, 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 um, this is, I mean, you can imagine, you're 17, you've done you're basic. a month's training. You, you're, you're totally wet around the ears. You've been on a train. The closer you get to the front, the more kind of allied aircraft seem to come over and everyone's telling you to dive for cover every two minutes. You arrive into some ruins. Um, you just, you know, you're next to, you are just cannon fodder. I mean, that's all you can ever hope to be. Although you might be formerly Hitler Youth cannon fodder, so you think you're doing the right thing. So, you know. Well, well, whatever. But, 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 whatever. you know. You, yeah, exactly, this, whatever. <laughs> but, but by this stage, already... The frontline units of 14th Panzer Corps, which is covering this stretch of the line, are already down to kind of 80% losses. Okay. Well, we're going to take a very quick break as Mark Clark is determined to hammer the Gustav line, not just in one place, but in many, many places, because he has many, many things that forces at his disposal. We will see you very shortly. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Um, 80% losses, yet the Germans fight on. I mean, you know, if we were to do, do a drop-down menu rabbit hole, that would be one in itself. I mean, how on earth are they are they clinging on? And why on earth? I mean, the, I mean, we've done the why on earth, actually. We've done the why on earth, which is that that they have to. They've got no option. The how is, well, I kind of, it's, it, it's, a, it's a kind of mystery, but it's Zellner's diary entry for the 16th of January. Yeah, it's um, amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Do you want to read it or shall I? Well, you read this one. You read I one. write in my diary, I have to go to the regiment at 4pm. It will be the deployment order. So this is after he's been given his 70 new blokes. No, the 70 new blokes are just coming. Oh, just coming. So, so I mean, so whatever. <laughs> um, it will be the deployment order. Very well. It would also be the first Sunday we hadn't been deployed. There are hours when you sit or lie idle and let your thoughts run free. It looks as if you're resting. And yet it is precisely during such hours that you are mentally at your busiest. Personal life creeps into your soul, into your thoughts, and makes your heart beat faster than at work. What is my fate? That's how it sounds in your ears. If a grenade tears you apart, then it's over. Then the agony is over. Nonsense. It flashes through me. I want to live. Wounded. But how? I want to create and work. Trapped behind barbed wire. Terrible. My family? runs through my head. No, no, they have to live. You roll from one side to the other. I don't want to think about it anymore, you tell yourself. Yes, the crosses of the dead at the crossroads are not convenient. There are 17-year-olds underneath them. Damn, now I'm back to these thoughts again. I mean, it's amazing stuff, isn't it? It's absolutely incredible. You know, from someone who's there. I mean, that is written on that day. You know, and, and, and the awful thing about it is the battles of casino haven't happened yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that that's... That's still to come. I mean, yeah. it's 
it's absolutely insane, and and the the total ruthlessness with which Castlering is is having to to fight this battle. Yeah, and it is really interesting because increasingly there is a there is a window of opportunity for the Allies here, because Clark's bludgeoning through the the Bernhard line has worked. His bludgeoning up to the Gustav line because the Germans have stupidly fought ahead of it has also worked and further weakened the German forces. There is absolutely no question about it. They are ripe for the plucking if they can just sort of get their ducks in a row and, and, and deliver the right the right strikes of the fist at the right part of the body. That's the key in, in quick enough succession. And it's a bit like, you know, you can be hit in the head and you can be knocked unconscious or you can be hit in the head and, and you just stumble back a couple of paces. It depends on precisely where you're hit on how you'll you'll respond and, and and that's what's sort of going on now. So Trocchio is finally taken Monte Trocchio, this this weird kind of one that, that blocks the Liri Valley with its little shoulders. It's the most amazing place to climb up. You can still climb up there now. There's particularly if you're looking up towards Rome, so you're looking kind of sort of northwestwards, you can climb up on the left hand kind of southern saddle of of the shoulders. And you can get up, there's a lovely kind of olive grove on that saddle and you can look out and there it all is. There's the Liri Valley, this sort of Garden of Eden, the sort of land of promise beyond. And you can see the kind of, you know, the Abbey of Monte Cassino glinting in the afternoon sun. And there's the Monte Cassino Massive and the Upper Rapido Valley and Monte Cairo, which is Hiro, which is this huge 6,000 feet peak, which dominates the whole the whole landscape completely there it all is laid in front of you it's a, it's it's the most amazing place but beyond that is the the river garigliano the river rapido over which the texan division are now going to going to take part because the the red bulls have been pretty badly hammered just trying to get to the gustav line um they've taken hits nothing like the hits that the, the germans have taken but they're still it still cost them so the Texan division, the 36th Texan division, is going to take over. But before that, we're going to have the the, the British 10 Corps crossing um, over the Garigliano. And, and 56th division are going to cr- cross a little bit north of the of the coast. And 5th division are going to be crossing over the kind of sort of flat coastal plain across the Garigliano. The Garigliano at this point down on the south near Minterno is, you know, it's it's a stretch. It's, you know, it's 40, 40 yards wide. You know, right. it's two cricket pitches. It's wide and it's completely flat as a board either side of it but on the western side on the kind of side that's closer to rome the german side of it almost immediately particularly where 56 division are crossing hills rise up out of it these hills which develops into another mountain chain but but they're kind of hills at this point they're, they're kind of you know 900 foot high something like that and the germans have got ops in those hills and can so can bring fire down onto the onto the onto the river crossing quite easily and they've got they've got guns i assume on the reverse slopes all that all that yeah well it's interesting because there's a, there's a mass of mountains from the southern side of the liri valley so you've got monte cassino going southwards you've then got the liri valley for five miles then the mountains rise up again that's the runcy mountains with little foothills overlooking the you know little knolls and a knob sort of overlooking the garigliano as it winds south in front of them then there's a gap which is the Ascente valley which goes up to Osonia, um, which cuts in behind the Liri Valley, and and it's a kind of like it's like a sort of like a straight avenue, the Osenti Valley, that cuts between two loads of, of mountains. Then you've got immediately south of the Osenti Valley, you've got a kind of sort of triangular kind of hill mass which overlooks Minterno, and then you've got the coast. So you've got the coast road, which is the which is Highway Seven. Then you've got this triangular hill mass which is overlooking the Garigliano. Then you've got the Orsenti Valley running up to the Liri Valley. Then you've got the Orsoni Mountains, or Runcy Mountains. And what 10 Corps have got to do is they've got to get across this 45-yard wide river. Then they've got to get up onto the onto the hills and they've got to push them back, back get into the Orsenti Valley and then cut up to Orsonia. That's the plan. But inevitably, it's not that easy because the Germans have got wire and it's part of the gustav line and, and they filled it with mines thousands of mines on this scores of thousands yeah yeah scores of thousands and lots and lots particularly actually of anti-personnel mines and these are these shoe mines um which are uh, are can't be metal detected in the same way because they're usually box mines and these are these ones that kind of you hit and they then blow off your foot but they don't kill you and <laughs> really really vicious and they've got all the obvious crossing points zeroed so it's a 
it's a hell of an undertaking. And particularly fifth division has a very, very long approach. It's sort of, you know, two and a half mile approach across the the, flat, the plains. So everything has to be brought up through the mountains, the Rocaseca mountain chain on the eastern side. They've got to bring up artillery. So this is the 56 Heavy Regiment, which Spike Milligan's attached to. They've got to bring them into that hills. And then the infantry has got to sort of debouch from from those hills onto the floodplain and then get across. And all the ag- engineers have got to build these sort of bridges and stuff. They're going to get across originally in boats. And what happens is you get the first people in boats and you have people with wire so that you then just, you know, you monkey feed across the wire yeah. so everyone yeah, knows yeah, yeah. where they are because it's nighttime when they're doing the crossing and everything. But getting that across in the first place is 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 not very easy at all. And then the sappers have got to come up and do... Obviously, do the the, the Bailey bridge. Bridging. The Bailey bridging yeah. across a forty-five yard stretch is, you know, is a challenge. That's, that's yeah. not a small undertaking. They've managed to get a few assault craft, though they can take some tanks around the bottom of the sea, around the opening to the uh, of the Garriano River as it goes into the sea. They're going to cut, cut round that, and they've got an extra brigade of the of guards who have been attached to Fifth Division to kind of sort of give it a bit of extra ballast and a bit of extra strength. And this all ha- takes place on the night of the seventeenth, eighteenth of January, and it works. You know they get across, and and one of the reasons they get across is because it's the ninety fourth infantry division defending here, and they've already been quite battered, and are not the you know they're they're hardly kind of your best troops in your bag. You know these are all kind of sort of os battalions and and conscripted troops from Czechoslovakia and Poland and and whatnot who don't really want to be there, and they do manage to get up into the hills, but they don't manage to clear the hills. And and so that's a problem. And there's lots of sort of furious at- uh, counterattacking going on, as you can imagine, as the British hold take over the German positions and then the Germans counterattack and blah, blah, blah. And once again, it turns into a kind of sort of massive artillery duel. But the descriptions of crossing and the and the, the, the mines going off and the being mortared as they're crossing this river and desperately trying to get get up these first, you know, these lower slopes of these hills around Suio and Castelforte and and all these places and onto the sort of Monte Damiano. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And the casualties in the frontline battalions, they're all getting kind of fifty percent to a third completely lost within thirty six hours. You know, leading leading infantry companies, all officers gone you know, kept together by corporals and that sort of thing. I mean, it, it's very, very, very tough nut. But it's a success. It's not success in that they get to the Orsenti Valley and get all the way to Orsonia, but they do they do push the 94th Division back. And what happens is that Kesselring immediately reinforces this and realises that this is a major point of weakness because if the Allies, if the British manage to get up to Orsonia, they will cut in behind the Gustav line into the Leary Valley at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that can't be allowed to happen. So he immediately sends the the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division and the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division. The 90th Panzer Grenadier Division has been destroyed at Ortona on the Adriatic in December. Yes. Yes, it, um, it's been completely uh, totally eradicated. destroyed. Eradicated. So here we are back again. You know, it's down to kind of sort of 20% at Ortona. But that 20% is a big enough carder with replacements that it is now a functioning division again and sent to, you know, fire brigade this bit. The Germans are really good. They're, they're very, very good at this, aren't they? This uh, sort of Just... uh, paper paper formation, um, you know, because, because they, they, you know, the end of the Battle of Ortona, they've got 20%. So basically, they're, they're basically um, a letterhead at that point, the 29th Panzer Grenadier Division, aren't they? They're a headquarters. Yeah. Well, the 29th Panzer Grenadier have been the ones that have been defending, they've been defending Monte Samucro in December. Yeah. So they've been having to. Both of those divisions, the 90th Panzer Grenadier and the 29th Panzer Grenadier, have been brought back for refitting. And they've been in the kind of Rome area, refitting and, 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 and building up strength and stuff. So they're now at about a third strength. But the crux of this is, the absolute crux of this is, is. By the end of this, these offensives and these river crossings, how well defended is Anzio? Not at all. Well, there we are. So, so it works. It's working. It is absolutely working. working. It is working. Yeah. And this is the point. And, you know, von Sanger is the 14th Panzer Corps commander yeah. along this stretch of the line. So you've got 10th Army under Yeah. Corps. His main fighting corps is 14th Panzer Corps. And 
he's an interesting character because he's 52. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's a First World War veteran. He's a devout Catholic. He's very anti the regime. Yeah. And yet he feels there's nothing he can do. So he, he, you know, he could resign and say, I don't want to fight for you anymore and go home. But he doesn't. But he's, yeah. he's, you know, so I'm, I have sort of mild problems with Von Sanger as well for, for that reason. <laughs> I mean, you know, he doesn't have to fight there. And, you know, he's obviously a very competent soldier and competent commander. But at this point, he's thinking, this is time to pull back to the Caesar line. And Von Weitinghoff is going, do you know what? It's time to pull back to the Caesar line. And Von Mackensen says, who is commander of the 14th Army, goes, I don't like I, this. Is I don't like this. Yeah, yeah. I don't like this at all. I'm not interested in now going south. I quite like being in the north in Verona, thank you very much. You know, I'm having a nice time and no one's bothering me. <laughs> the only person, senior commander, that's up for this is Kesselring. Yeah. But he now furiously reinforces the Garriano front down on the on this southern side and also sends the first Falchamiega Corps, which is part of 14th Army, which is north of Rome at this point. So he sends them down south as well. So denuding his option or re- reducing his options further north. And and after all, it's all about drawing soldiers away. It's all about drawing German assets to the to the front, creating an emergency and drawing the German assets away. And they and Clark su- succeeded in that entirely. Exactly. So 10 Corps has has attacked over the Garriano. Again, this is one of these, it's, you know, it's the most amazing action. It's the most amazing battle and, and it's completely forgotten. And it's just, it's so unfair on all those people that fought there that no one remembers them anymore. But it is an amazing action. And there are some incredible accounts from both sides of, of of what it was like, and and it's a fascinating bit of landscape as well. I mean, you know, when you when you're standing in the village of Suyo, which is in the German side of the Garriano, and you're looking down at the Garriano, you're just going, "What the heck?" I mean, how on earth could they have attacked across the river here? But they do and do it successfully. The next next one is is forty six divisions crossing, which is due to take place on the nineteenth of January, and this is just at the southern end of the. Liri Valley, so at the foot of the, you know, just at the foot of the um of the Aruncy Mountains. And the problem is here is that unbeknown to them, the previous night the Germans have opened some sluice gates at the Liri Valley. And the reason they've done this is because the British are attacking on the Garriano and they want to increase the flow of the Garriano and make it yeah. difficult for Ten Corps to get their their you know cross over the Garriano on that front. So very sensible from a German point of view. Yeah, yeah. But what this means is suddenly you've got this incredibly fast flow across the Garriano where 24 hours before you didn't. And they simply can't get the boats across. Every time they, you know, they try, they just go, and get sort of swept down the river. You know, they just can't can't do it. And, and and men are trying to sort of swim across and getting drowned in the process, and trying to get these wires across so that they can kind of you know monkey grip and work their way across it, and they just they just can't do it, so it fails. And this is a bit of a blow for the next attack, which of course is the Texans going across the across the Ripper Rabito. And you know we talked about that in an earlier podcast a couple of weeks ago, but 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 really, Fred Walker, who is the commander of the thirty six Texans, is very down on the whole thing. And, and cannot see a way through and cannot see how this can happen. And he doesn't appreciate that the Germans are actually, it's the 15th Panzer Division, Panzer Grenadier Division across this stretch of the line, also incredibly weakened and in no real position for for resistance because it's just the infantry going over with a kind of sort of rather half assed artillery barrage. The Americans don't make any headway at all. But had they actually smothered the infantry crossing with, with much closer form artillery fire from tanks and from anti-aircraft guns, these quads, 50 caliber machine gun quads, they absolutely could have done it. I'm not saying that they wouldn't have had a huge amount of losses, but but it could have been done. Yeah, um, It's yeah, yeah. just that the, the battle plan for the Rapido is so negative. And the reason it's so ne- it's it's so bad is because Walker's got it into his head that it's impossible. So he's just not engaging his brain properly. I mean the the fact is it is possible. You, we've of course it's talked possible. about yeah of course because we've they've their successful crossings happening at the same time. So it's it's completely doable. It's a thing that's completely doable. It, you know even though the uh, as we said earlier you know the, the Germans have 
the Germans German sappers have been busy and there are mines everywhere and there are we've talked to the podcast before, but the earlier stages of the invasion in Italy where the Germans mine every bridge, every pass, they demolish every single um road that they possibly can to stymie the Allied advance. And yet and yet the Allies push on and it, it, you know, it, yes, it is slow, but it's but it's inexorable. I mean, that's the, the the other thing about this Allied advance is it is inexorable. No matter what the Germans do, whether they whether they hold a line solidly or they spend people unnecessarily in between their lines, it's an inexorable advance. And just just to put this into some perspective, you know, one of, some of the troops that are now part of Fifteenth Panzer Grenadier Division defending the Liri Valley and the and the River Rapido where the Texans are crossing is Zellner's third battalion. His 70 men. So yeah. the idea that this is a kind of sort of, you know, invincible force. Uh, so, so what what one has to understand is that firing mortars, teams of three, firing machine guns, teams of two, teams of three, is really not very difficult. You know, you, you sit in your foxhole or your, your place of, of hiding and you fire. And when you see infantry coming towards you, you just keep firing and you just keep firing. And it's very difficult for artillery shells to put down that kind of fire because the only way you're going to knock out a mortar piece is by a direct hit. And that's very difficult to achieve when they're dug into a position. And ditto with a, a machine gun team. So what you need is you need tanks with their main guns and machine guns that can just spray those German positions because machine guns are, are quite far forward. So too mortars and hammer those. And you also bring in those quads, those 50 caliber machine gun four machine guns on a kind of light anti-aircraft job they're, they're on they're on track vehicles or on trucks or whatever that, that you you put them in the back of your truck you've got a, ma- a man behind them and just going with four machine guns all just pumping out lead that's what you need they are not used at all there's something like 350 tanks and tank destroyers which are are you know these m10s which are are high velocity anti-tank guns on a tracked vehicle it looks like a sherman but isn't so they've got 350 of those or something like that, or 250. I mean, they've got a huge number on which they can call about, none of which are used in this battle at all. And the situation is made worse by the fog, but the fog should have helped them rather than than the enemy, you know, because that means you can infiltrate. So if you if you if if your your troops are infiltrating behind a wall of fire machine gun fire, heavy caliber machine gun fire and 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 tank rounds and, and anti-tank guns suppressing machine gun posts and mortars it should have been a piece not a piece of cake but it should have been a lot easier than it is over two nights two days and two nights it they don't get across they make little bridgeheads loads of them get captured the casualties from six attacking battalions and if you think a battalion an american battalion is about 890 men strong 143 killed so that's 24 per battalion of 890 663 wounded and 875 missing in action, presumed POW. Now, I would say that the the killed in action losses are, they're obviously significant, but they're not as high as some other actions in Italy. Mm. And it's because Walker's just down on the whole thing. You know, he, yeah, he's... It's, it's the men taken prisoner that's the, that's the, that's a battalion's worth of people taken prisoner, isn't it? Yeah. That's the one that, that tells you Something's something's gone yeah, wrong. Yeah, so in really. total, they've lost two battalions out of the six. But for for Germans, that's plenty. I mean, you know that that, that means you've you've almost at full strength. Well, yes, exactly. If you're the Germans, you say, well, okay, you can have two days off, and then next Tuesday you'll be you'll, you'll be back in on Tuesday. Don't worry about it. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. But the plus side of all this, so so the Rapido crossing doesn't work. The forty six crossing doesn't work. Ten core crossing absolutely does work. Yeah. But the net result of all that is absolutely that it's drawn off lots of troops. And what that means is that um, in the Anzio area, there are no more than about 800 German troops of all sorts. And most of them are kind of sort of railway admin men. Blimey. When the Allies land on the 22nd of January. LOC, as they're called, Line of Communication Troops. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. So the conditions for the Anzio landing are pretty good. And that's where we should get to. In our next episode. Episode three. Three! <laughs> Episode three of Having Got a Shingle. <laughs> well, we've done the background. Yeah, we've, we've done the background. We've, we've buttered the piece of bread ready for the sandwich. May even have put a bit of relish on it. Um, Right, if you um are listening to this series and what you want is to just crack on with it, then you can join our Patreon. We have ways of making you talk Patreon. Or you can uh, go to our Apple channel where you can listen to this advert free and also all in one go. 
this entire series all in one go. If you just can't wait to find out what happened next in the question of sports style. Um, we also have our festival. Um, we have ways of making you talk festival. Um, July the 18th to 21st, where this kind of chat, this kind of waffle, the historians that we've had on the podcast over the years um, will be there to do panels, to talk about what they're interested in, to talk about the subject. 1944, obviously, the 18th anniversary, we themed around this year. There will be tanks. There will be aircraft. There will be reenactors. Uh, or living historians, rather, there will be entertainments, alarums, and excursions of every kind imaginable around this subject. And we hope to see you there. We have waysfest.co.uk is the website for that. Um, we will see you in our next episode, part three, which was meant to be part two, but them's the breaks. Yeah, we'll work it all out. <laughs> but one thing exactly. I would recommend is that if you're listening to this while you're on your commute or walking the dog or whatever you're doing, um, it's really, really worth going on to Google Earth and looking up these places. Absolutely. Pastel Forte, Casino, Suio, which is S-U-I-O, Minterno. The uh, crossing over the River Rapido is uh, at Sant'Angelo in Theodici. Uh, and look up all these places and it'll all become obvious and you'll suddenly start to realise what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's very hard describing geography on a podcast. I mean, I actually think you do a pretty good job of describing it, Jim, but... Do you? Okay, well, thank you. If people want to see those locations, they will all be up on our Patreon. So you can have a good, you can have a good look... Familiarise yourself with the with walk the ground virtually, as it were. And uh, that's on our Patreon. We have ways of making you talk, which is a tremendous value for money experience, if I say so myself. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. We will see you very soon. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Hi there. If you've just really enjoyed that episode of We Have Ways and want a bit more of Al Murray and his passion for history in your life, I have good news for you. I'm Emily Dean and I'm delighted to say that this week Al is a guest on my podcast Walking the Dog where you get to hear well-known faces at their most relaxed because I talk to them over a leisurely outdoor stroll with my dog Raymond. So do join us this week for a very special in-depth chat with Al Murray where he tells us the whole story behind the podcast and his love of history. Because what we used to do before we did the podcast if he was in town he'd say can we have lunch I, I want to talk about Normandy or whatever. Congratulations, it's been a good 40 minutes and you've not even mentioned 1944, well, no, 1939. We've, we've, we've just got there. <laughs> if you want to hear more of my chat with Al, give Walking the Dog a listen this week. And while you're there, you can take your pick from episodes starring the likes of Ricky Gervais, Jack Whitehall and Jimmy Carr. So listen to Walking the Dog now wherever you get your podcasts.